Um, so uh, our project was based on genome editing, um, um, a CRISPR-Cas9 overview by Aaron Yu, Nihal Lamataman, Jasmine Flores, and Melissa Hernandez. Next slide. Um, here's a historical lens of CRISPR. CRISPR first detected in E. coli in 1987. Yoshizumi Ishino, a Japanese scientist, and his unit detected CRISPR in E. coli. They accidentally cloned an irregular series of repeated sequences unified with spacer sequences when observing a gene responsible for conversion of alkaline phosphate. Due to the time of the discovery, it was deemed impossible to determine the biological functions of these sequences due to a lack of sufficient DNA sequence data. In 1993, um, there was a discovery of CRISPR and uh, M tuberculosis. A group of researchers led by J.D. Van Embedden in the Netherlands made a discovery between different strains of M tuberculosis and characterized M tuberculosis using a technique known as um, spalagiotyping. This led to a, a variety of these sequences being found in other bacteria and archaeal genomes. Francisco Mojica and Rich Jensen were the first scientists to call these repeats CRISPRs. Um, in 2000, um, there was a research for CRISPR adaptive immune response. Originally, when first identified, CRISPRs were first thought uh, were thought to be a novel DNA repair tool in the thermophilic archaea and bacteria. However, Francisco and Mojica and his team took notice of these spacer sequences and how similar they look to sequences in the bacteriophages, viruses, and plasmids. Subsequently, they discovered that viruses are not able to infect bacteria harboring homologous spacer sequences, which implied that these sequences might contribute in adaptive immune response systems in prokaryotes. In 2012, um, CRISPR was being used for genome editing. A group of four, George Church, Jennifer Didna, uh, Emmanuel Charpenter, and Feng Zheng, um, discovered that by designing guide RNA to target a precise location in the genome, CRISPR can be used to modify the genome. Next slide. So this gene editing technology involves two essential components for its applications, a guide RNA and Cas9. The first part of the complex, Cas9, which is, a, is an endonucleus that essentially cuts up the DNA, allowing modifications to be made to the genome. The second part is the guide RNA sequence, which directs Cas9 to a specific location in the DNA where the edit should be made. By fusing these two components together, CRISPR-Cas9 is able to edit parts of an organism's genome by removing, adding, or even altering sections of the DNA strand. The process begins with the Cas9 RNA complex searching through segments of DNA for its target site. Cas9 unwinds a section of DNA and verifies if the guide RNA sequence matches. If the sequence is paired completely, Cas9 cuts the DNA, forming a double-stranded break. After this, three main categories of genetic edits can be performed. One, the break in our DNA causes our cells to naturally respond by activating DNA repair pathways called non-homologous and joining. This process may lead to the additional deletion of a few base pairs, which disrupts the original DNA sequence and can cause the gene to be disabled. Two, a larger piece of DNA can be deleted by targeting independent sites on either side of the targeted deletion with two different guide RNAs. The repair process joins the separate ends, deleting the intervene or middle sequence. And three, corrections can also be made to the DNA by adding a third component to the Cas9 RNA complex called the repair template. This DNA template is designed with sequences that match the DNA adjacent to the target cut site. Through a process called Homology Directed Repair, the cell uses the template to repair the break, thereby replacing the faulty DNA sequence or even inserting a new gene sequence. Let's now delve into the ethical considerations of CRISPR. So in this study in 2018, when CRISPR was first used to edit the genome of two twins, this started a very heated debate on the ethical um, implications. And that can be divided into three key facets. So the first facet is really how it can um, deepen the gap of socioeconomic disparity. Um, if um, wealth status can affect the, ac the accessibility of such a novel and not yet um, widely used um, biotech as CRISPR. And so many people are concerned that um, tech such as designer babies might um, cause people of different socioeconomic classes to have different access to um, these of um, 
uh, ability enhanced um, genes, like for example, high IQ, um, athletic ability, and etc. And so, besides that, CRISPR is also taken into consideration because of um, if a person's genome is widely accessible, then that could cause an onslaught of of, of discrimination of people who don't have um, a quote unquote perfect genes and that's really defined as if like that person is liable to um, different kinds of diseases um, and other kind of liabilities and so that really compromises the HIPAA data which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act and it and it's it's discrimination isn't um, really only for things like jobs but also for housing as well and so it's starting to take for a, a it's, it's starting to take um kind of a bigger role in the real world besides just um um in, in uh, besides just enhancing some kind of traits like in designer babies and moreover that kind of ties into um along the similar lines of how really if a genome is that accessible then how the person's consent um kind of like how long that can like um be taken into account for example if somebody was involved in two unrelated cases if that can be tracked forensically at a crime scene and so really um all, all in all this kind of encapsulates these kind of dystopian um novels um for example brave new world and barco tattoo and so um crispr um to kind of create these um, in enhancements in ability. You can see it at three um, zoomed in levels of the nucleotide, chromosomal, and genomic levels. Next slide, please. So CRISPR, um, as of now, CRISPR really benefits um, those who have um, genetic diseases that are like because of point mutations. And so, Point mutations, they are mutations caused by a change in one single nucleotide, and it's it's more um, convenient for CRISPR to target these um, in particular um, as of now because that means that there. So essentially, if one, so if each cell has the same DNA but just um, not all turned on because of differentiation, but if they all have um, the same DNA and there's so many cells in the human body, then it's pretty difficult to make so many changes. But that's why point mutations, um, those are ones that are most hard, that are most targeted. And some of the more common ones um, that are also point mutations are cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia. And sickle cell anemia. And so for um, cystic fibrosis, you see um, CRISPR targeted in the CFTR gene, and for sickle cell anemia, you see it targeted in the HBB gene. And so here you can see CRISPR-Cas9 in the context of a neuron, and really all of this can be taken into context. Um, so in this TED Talk in 2013, um, one of the co-founders of CRISPR talked about how CRISPR is kind of like that grammar um, feature you see on like Word documents. So it's kind of like that, how it's more um, kind of kind of easier like at this point in time to target these uses like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell of point um, mutations. Next slide, please. So um, from all of this, there are future implications. Um, CRISPR, uh, Cas9 is still a recent discovery within the biological field and the beginning of clinical trials with CRISPR Cas9 are in progress. Scientists have been seeking ways to widen their range of approaches to improve the safety and adequacy of these trials. Additionally, in the future, we may see CRISPR Cas9 technology used to improve the research in crop studies. And some potential eradications that are being worked with CRISPR Cas9 right now are cancer, blood disorders, blindness, AIDS, HIV infections, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, Huntington's disease, and COVID-19. And to the right are the um, discoverers of um, Cas9. Uh, here are, we're excited. Um, thank you for listening to our presentation.